You walk around St. Petersburg looking at all these icicles, then you see these constantly shaking tiles in Moscow. Everything is covered in dirt and mud. But then you come to Finland and realize the standard of living can be much better. Finland is Russia's northern neighbor. It's only a few kilometers away from Murmansk, Leningrad regions and Republic of Karelia. But it seems that in terms of development these two countries aren't just separated by border crossing checkpoints, but a huge decades-long gap. He pats me on the shoulder, saying Russians are great, but Putin is terrible. Finnish government aims for economic equality of its citizens and preserves landmarks. This building is probably 30 to 40 years old, but it looks as if it has only just been built. You can use it as a set for a movie about those times without changing anything. In the winter people ride their bicycles along the clear streets in the powder white snow. Look at this, it's amazing, it's a cold winter morning and there's a busy bicycle traffic on the way to a Finnish school. And ice blocks don't fall on the people from the roofs. There aren't any icicle on any of the roofs, but you can see the heating wires everywhere. I came to Finland to show you what a proper winter looks like and tell you about how Russia's ex-region became the happiest country in the world. I want to find out how they managed to lay tiles so straight in such a climate. But before we begin, I'd like to make a disclaimer. The video was shot before the Ukrainian crisis. The video may seem too carefree and positive right now, but I hope it helps you to take your mind off the problems in these hard times. Please like this video and subscribe to my channel. And don't forget to share this video on Reddit and send it to your friends via WhatsApp. Hi everyone, we're finally in Finland. I didn't just come over here for nothing. Each year Russia faces dozens of problems due to the cold season. Icicles, ice buildups on road, dirt, people struggle to walk across pavements as they not get cleaned properly or, on the contrary, they've been covered with road salt that ruins your shoes. I haven't even started talking about the poor pets who are getting hurt. People are sleeping and breaking their legs. It sounds like a horror story, but it's true. When we're talking about Russian winter, officials usually explain that nothing can be done, it's winter, you just have to be patient. And so I wondered, how do the Finns deal with winter? I'm currently in Helsinki, that is some 30 kilometers away from St. Petersburg. The two cities are similar, they both on the shore of the Baltic Sea, the climate is almost the same, in Helsinki there is even more precipitation. It's quite funny actually, in Russia they blame everything on winter. Whatever suggestion you make, the response is always... No, this is impossible, we have winter for 9 months, we can't build proper public spaces, we can't build cycle lanes, we can't do anything because the winter is long and cold. So, we'll explore Finland and we'll try to find out how the Finns deal with winter. Is it really a factor that is not possible to overcome? Finland's capital treats snowfall and ice buildups much more responsibly than Russia's St. Petersburg. And the authorities do not claim that the poor janitorial services are criticized only by people who got paid for it. Helsinki's authorities prefer to take action instead of talking. I'm going to show you how the city functions during the winter. Note that I'm walking down a completely clean street. It's some kind of magic. There's no snow, no icicles, no ice buildups, no drifts. No salt and granite chips, which I usually sprinkle on the streets. What is the secret? The thing is that several central streets of Helsinki are heated from underneath. The snow falls down on the street, it immediately melts and goes into the rain drain. And these central streets are always in any weather, in any winter, in any frost, absolutely clean. It's pleasant and comfortable to walk along them. It seems like a simple solution, but for some reason it's almost never used in Russia. In Moscow we have a small heated area near the Manij, where the entrance to the Kremlin is. But apart from that, there don't seem to be any other heated streets in Moscow and St. Petersburg. At least I haven't seen any of them. By the way, the heating system here is regulated by computers. The temperature, depending on the weather, is said to make this magic heating as cheap as possible. And in fact, it doesn't cost that much. In general, when we talk about the proper streets management, we have to take in account that the injuries people suffer, for example, by sleeping on icy sidewalks, are also a cost. 
It comes as an expense for the healthcare system. Not to mention the damage to health. People simply stop working if they're injured. In Russia, these costs and expenses are usually not taken into account, so they don't spend as much on cleaning, and you simply cannot do it. Look how clean this street is. Here is the border with the street which isn't heated. Now let me show you my favorite architectural feature in Finland. Finns keep all the original doors. Here you can't just break down doors, break down shop windows and put in some plastic metal garbage in instead, especially if it comes to historic buildings, architectural monuments. There's a cool Art Nouveau building behind me, and I think it's about 100 years old. Let's see what the doors look like. There are different shops here. Traditionally, the tenants rent the ground floor. That said, none of the tenants have changed the front door. Here's a store called Lindros, selling some jewelry. As we can see, they kept the original door. Next, we have another jewelry shop. Here, even though they don't need the door, it's still here. They just use it as a shop front window in that door and put watches on display. But they kept the locks, the little enamel plug, the door handle. So the whole door is preserved in its original form. Moving forwards and again the door. And everything else is in place. Next we have the polo shop. They covered the window with their advertising banners, but the door and the handle are in place. The doors on the front are of a different design, but again, they are all original doors. There is even a Helsinki sign hanging here. It's probably the manufacturer of the handle and the grill. Here's an amazing example. It's the wonderful door. Look at this beauty. All the shops, no matter how fancy they are, but the doors and handles are authentic. Of course, I'm not even talking about the front doors. Obviously, everything's in perfect condition. You just walk around and admire it. I walk around looking at the center of Helsinki and trying to find a single icicle. So far, I haven't been able to. The roofs are completely clean, not a single icicle. And you can also notice that the rainwater downpipes go underground. It's heated from above, heated from below, there are no icicles and no problems. When you walk in St. Petersburg or Moscow, you constantly look up so that you don't get killed by an icicle. When you walk in Helsinki, you quickly relax, as you don't need to look up all the time. I spent half a day walking around the Finnish capital and I haven't seen a single icicle, not even a small one. How did it do it? It's a big, big secret. In fact, there is no secret, they're just using heating. It's simple, guys. You heat up the downpipes, you heat up the roof, and that's it. The icicles just don't form. If it's snow, everything just melts and goes down the drain. Nothing falls on people's heads. And again, it's relatively cheap solution. Russian authorities usually say that it costs millions, there's no money for it. All of the money is spent on rockets that will destroy the whole world sooner or later. Actually, it's not that expensive. Once again, these methods are quite old. It's not some sort of new innovation. It's just basic cheap heating that allows to get rid of icicles and solve the problem associated with them. And I think the fundamental difference between Finnish and Russian approach to winter is the cost of the human life. Finns believe that human life is priceless and no one in the city should get hurt or die from falling icicles or experience any discomfort. In Russia, as we know, human life is worthless and if an icicle falls down on your head, if you sleep and you break your leg, you will certainly not receive any compensation. At most, the authorities will say, well, it's just bad luck. But in Finland, everybody is lucky. There aren't many heated streets in Finland. Most of them are just sprinkled with granite chips if it gets icy. 
The first thing that catches my eye is that I'm walking on a pavement that is completely icy, but I can't walk on it without being afraid. Why? Because it's all covered with these granite chips. In Finland, they don't use those chemicals that are dangerous for the soil, animals and shoes. Instead, the environmentally friendly, recyclable material is used. When the snowy season is over, the chips are removed from the pavement with a special machine similar to lawnmower, washed and stored until next winter. And if they are no longer suitable for reuse, the granite chips are sent to the other industries, such as construction materials or to build roads. In Finland, the city authorities are only responsible for cleaning the main streets. The rest of the roads, pavements and courtyards are a responsibility of the residents and the owners of the nearby buildings. People either clean everything themselves or hire private companies to do so. The companies may also work differently, which is why there are some striking contrasts in the way they clean everything on one street, while the neighboring one is snowy and ice and mess. The snow is usually removed at night, so the machines don't disturb people and cars. They probably don't clean the streets as precisely as, for example, in the center of the Moscow when they remove all the snow. You can see that they don't clean the car parks very well, and this is most likely due to the fact that, as you can see here, there are some cars that have been parked here for quite a long time. I was walking through the main streets of Helsinki and came to the largest Orthodox cathedral in Scandinavia. The Greek Orthodox Church is the second most popular religion in Finland, after Lutheranism, which is practiced by more than 3,700,000 Finns. According to figures from Statistics Finland, more than 60,000 of Finnish citizens consider themselves Christian Orthodox. The Uspensky Cathedral was built in Helsinki in the second half of the 19th century, when Finland was already a part of the Russian Empire. The former Swedish duchy was annexed to Russia after the Russian-Swedish War in 1809. Finland's status in the empire was relatively loyal. There was no forced Russification, Swedish and Finnish were considered the official languages. Russia didn't meddle in Finland's affairs, so Finland had its own government bodies, which included just Finns themselves, as well as the army and customs office. The Russian emperor had retained the Finnish constitution after Russia annexed the new territory. That's even though in Russia itself the constitution didn't even exist at that time. Three years after Russia's accession, Alexander I decided that the capital city of Finland would be moved to Helsingfors, one of the largest cities of the autonomy that we all know today as Helsinki. Since then, the Russian authorities have undertaken massive construction in the modest, rather rural town. One of the things they wanted to do was to please the Orthodox commune that had formed here, which became too large for the old small church that was here. The church was erected in the impoverished area where poor people and criminals lived. The Uspensky Cathedral stood out among the other buildings in the area so much that the authorities decided to urgently rebuild everything around the church, so the surroundings would also look appropriate. Until the 15th century there was no unified state administration in Finland. There was just tribal villages of three people – Suomi, Karelians and Tavastas. They had little interaction with each other and were influenced by Swedes. In Swedish times, Finland was kind of a bear's corner, it was sparsely populated. As a part of the Russian Empire. Finland was a so-called Grand Duchy. Finland's autonomous rights, in particular, were expressed in the fact that it had its own Valtovapavit, which is translation from Swedish Riksdag. It's kind of a parliament, a kind of local legislative assembly. During the Russian Revolution, the Finnish self-government seized the opportunity and declared its independence. A civil war broke out in a new state. The Reds were supported by Soviet Russia and the Whites by Germany and Sweden. The Whites eventually won, so that Finland was no longer dependent on Russia. After gaining independence, Finland, of course, was able to take advantage of those foundations, those achievements, which it had accumulated during the period of autonomy, meaning that the state institutions already existed. The relations within the Soviet Union were, understandably as we know, quite cold. But they were still present, nevertheless. Finland was used as a transit territory in the Soviet Union's trade within the countries of the Western Europe. But it is also clear that it had something to gain from the transit. 
In 1939, a war broke out between the USSR and Finland over border territories. The Soviets wanted to push the border away from Leningrad and Mormons to protect them from the invasion from a neighboring country. Eventually, the Soviet Union succeed. Thereafter, Finland fought against the Soviet Union in World War II and sided with Germany, for which it paid reparations to its neighbors. Finland, as a neutral country, after the so-called Cold War had already started, was able to invest less in its armed forces. There is also a certain influence of the so-called reparations. Yes, of course, it was burdensome for Finland, but there is another side to it, because the Soviet side was ready to accept part of the reparations not in money, but in some sort of goods, some industrial produce. This is precisely what contributed to the development of these Finnish industries. Reminders of the complicated Finnish-Russian relations can be traced not only in the architecture and historical textbooks, but also in Finnish speech. The Finns sometimes refer to Russian-speaking newcomers in derogatory manner Rusia. In the first half of the 19th century, this word was neutral and referred to all the people from the Russian Empire. However, since Finland gained independence in the 20th century, the civil and the Soviet-Finnish wars, the word Rusia is considered offensive. Before the war with Ukraine, relations between the two countries had improved. Russians could travel here and vice versa without any strict restrictions. Since 3rd of September 2022, entry to Finland by Russians with tourist visas been banned. According to the Finnish Statistics Office, during 2020 there were more than 28,000 Russians living in Finland. However, in everyday life Russian speakers can still hear the insulting Rusia. During the 2021 World Junior Ice Hockey Championship match between Russia and Finland, a Finnish fan held up a banner with an offensive slogan Rusia have been overthrown. The picture was quickly taken down, but the Russophobic incident was still hardly debated on social media. I talked about Helsinki and life in Finland with my Russian immigrant friends who moved here a few years ago. What is this? This is actually a common thing for a Senate Square, because they collect the snow from all over here, pile it up, and then take it out. St. Petersburg and Helsinki are very similar in terms of climate. They are not far away from each other, the temperature is almost the same, they both on the shore of Baltic Sea. Yeah. The question is, why do they clear the snow of the streets better? Where is the most comfortable in terms of life during winter? My friends in St. Petersburg, where I lived for 17 years, will be offended, but it's more comfortable living here. Yes, it's more comfortable living here. We've been living in Finland for three years now. I have no complaints about how snow is removed in any of the Finnish cities. When it snows a lot, the first task is to clear the main roads, both driveways and pavements. Then, when they clear it all, they start to clear pavements, pedestrian crossings, and they stack it in these huge piles. They don't care much about it. They pile up huge mountains of snow, because they'll have to clean it all up anyway. After the walk, we drove to the town of Espo, where Lev and Angelika have a flat. Espo is only 20 kilometers away from Helsinki, it's the second largest city in Finland, with a population of over 290,000 people. Whereas in Helsinki it's 656,000. There are several types of housing. There is housing provided by the city, that's the cheapest option. There is a state subsidied housing, which is called ARA, which means that the state pays extra money to the companies, not to us, the tenants, but to the companies which is why this housing is cheaper than the market average. And there are companies which own houses for profit, they rent them out, and this is the most expensive housing. To rent a flat like this, there's a wealth limit based on your income. If you own a real estate, if you have a big salary, then most likely you won't be able to rent a flat in this kind of house. There is a limit to how much you can earn. How much is your rent here? Our flat costs $1,050. $1,050? A flat like this that isn't subsidied will cost about two or three hundred more. 
We've seen the courtyard. Now let's have a look in the common room for all tenants. There's quite a lot of them in Finnish houses, by the way, and the cost of the maintenance of the such spaces is all included in the rental price. A lot of children, grannies and so on, hardly anyone rides a bike in the winter. You can see that only few have studded tires. Talking about today's hot topic, let me just remind you that I shot this video in February, before the hostilities in Ukraine. So this is also a bomb shelter. Finland is always ready if someone attacks it, and all the houses always have a bomb shelter. Let's go and see what it looks like. If something happens, everyone will go here. There's water, a ventilation system, everything that's stored will be quickly taken out and people can wait for the attack to end here. You can't store things on balconies, so there's a storage space here instead. This is our home. Traditionally, all the walls are always painted white. This is the children's room, standard bathroom, there are no baths. In Finland, it will always be a shower. Another important nuance in every flat is the sauna. How often do you use it? At least once a week. And if I come home from shooting the video outside and I'm cold, I can warm up in sauna. Here's our bedroom, it's a little bit bigger. The flats in Finland have these building wardrobes. This is the living room and the kitchen. After our break of the war in Ukraine, Finland fully supported the anti-Russian sanctions and said that it's ready to tighten them. In addition, President Sauli Niisto said that the country could cooperate more closely with the United States on defense issues. There is even a speculation that Finland may join NATO in the near future. The country has also frozen Finnish-Russian cooperation between universities and research centers. However, the local Ministry of Education and Culture noted that anyone can still apply to the study or research in Finland regardless of the citizenship. What about the speeding fines? How tough is it here? It's harsh, because the fines are progressive, depending on your income. The more you earn, the more you get fined. Wow, so the fines for the same offense are different for different people. Yes. The biggest fine for speeding in Finland was imposed on the son of the richest businessman in 2004 when he exceeded the speed limit twice and was fined $180,000. Before that, the biggest fine for breaking traffic rules in the country belonged to Nokia's chief executive. In 2002, he exceeded the speed limit by 25 kilometers and paid $125,000 for it. Since Finland gained its independence, it has successfully coped with all crises and difficulties and is now considered one of the richest and most developed nations in the world. In 2019, the country was ranked as third safest country by Global Finance magazine. Finland is ranked 11th in UN's 2020 Human Development Report in terms of its standard of living and life expectancy. And the happiness of its people depends, among other things, on financial equality. In Finland, it is created through strong social support and a narrow income gap between the rich and the poor. It's the taxes that help to achieve this. They are divided into council and state taxes. Council taxes depend on the region that residents are paid in any case. But the state tax rate is set according to the person's income. Meaning the more person earns, the more tax they have to pay. If income of a person is less than $20,000 per annum, they do not have to pay anything into state budget. It's the same in kindergartens. If a family is low income, then child goes to kindergarten for free or for a small fee. In this way, all citizens have a possibility to send their child to a good preschool. Let me tell you about the public transport system in Helsinki too. The most convenient way to get around Helsinki is on the tram. A single ticket costs $2.6. And to save money, there are daily passes. 
that costs eight dollars a duty ticket for 12.5 dollars a weekly one for 33.5 dollars the tram here is the main form of the public transport they say the roads run through the most picturesque places in helsinki and they themselves are very comfortable it's rarely very crowded and they go strictly on the schedule all of the trams are painted in nice green and yellow. This tram has adverts all over it, don't take it into account. By the way, they didn't always look like that. Until the mid-80s, all of the trams in Helsinki were painted in grey orange. In addition to the current routes, there is a separate museum line and a section of road where you can see a tram pub. The tram system in Helsinki is still growing, with new lines planned up to 2035. Here's the classic color palette of the Helsinki tram. A noble green with beige and orange colors. The trams are very beautiful here. I decided to take a tram to next point on my route, so here we go. I got to the campus center. It's a large complex in the heart of the Finnish capital, and the place is an example of good space planning. I'm currently outside, and behind me is just a shopping center with offices and apartment buildings around it. In reality, there are two transfer hubs for buses and coaches, a metro station and a warehouse. What's more, everything's underground. So buses line up right here, under these trees, and people set up for different cities in Finland. In general, when we are talking about combining retail and transportation functions, you have to be very careful. Because when you do a shopping complex and give it to businesses, for example, to build your free transport hub, businesses will always be tempted to prioritize trade, and the hub will be inconvenient for people. Well, let's see how the Finns have done it. We are currently on the lower ground level, where people are awaiting boarding. They are standing here, like in an airport, near the gates, and you can see that the aisle is quite wide, and when passengers are here with their suitcases and stuff, the shops on the left don't get in their way. Here's the diagram, on which you can see that we are on the lower ground level, there's also the underground level for the metro, and there's another level for buses. So you can imagine how deep down this goes. And the most important thing is that they managed to get rid of a huge transportation hub, and it doesn't ruin the streets, it doesn't take up space, so it's all hidden underground. On the left we have comfortable moving sidewalks, and on the right there is absolutely disgusting advertising. Of course, in terms of aesthetic, the Finns haven't done enough, maybe because it's many years old, and they would have done something nicer now. But there's quite a lot of advertising. And one more disadvantage is that the shop signs are way too bright. Here, for example, the subway sign is huge and the metro sign is too tiny that it's hard to notice. So, speaking about the priority of navigation, it seems like the transport function should be primary, but here it is barely visible and the adverts are everywhere. This is, of course, confusing. Of course, a modern transportation hub can't exist without shops, without cafes, because people need to buy something to eat on the go. But the primary function is still the transportation. And we shouldn't forget that. Look, I was just following the signs for the underground, and I got thrown out onto the streets into cold Finnish wind. It's nightmare. And now I have to enter the underground separately. That is, I had to go outside to find a separate entrance. Everything about the navigation is pretty bad here as well. There is a display board that looks rather old. They could have gotten round to change it. In general, it all looks pretty... sad. I'm trying to find the underground map, but I don't see it. 
I can see an advertisement here, another one there, and a third one here as well. I see a very complicated transport scheme that shows where I am, a map of the area, but I don't see the underground map. That's what the ticket vending machines look like, by the way. They are a little bit outdated too, I guess they could be upgraded somehow. For example, they don't accept contactless payment, you have to stick a card in here. In terms of design, Helsinki's underground doesn't have anything to show off. It's not Moscow, St. Petersburg or even Stockholm, because in latter, although the underground is new, there are stations that look like wonderful caves. Great, we got down to the station. And come on, Ilya, figure it out where you're going. It would be cool if there was a map here. But there isn't one. There's a lot of advertising. It's really weird that there's no map with a city reference. Oh, finally, I just said there's no map and there it is. Look, I finally found a map of the city and now I can see where I'm going. For those of you who thought there aren't enough ads, They've put a projector to show commercials. Note that almost all the stations have 3D diagrams. I'm not sure if ordinary people understand it, but since I have an architectural background, I'm comfortable with it. The question is, if you don't have that experience, would you know how to read these 3D diagrams? Would you understand where you need to go? Let me know in comments. In addition to the standard escalators, there are also this inclined lift that allows you to go down to the station on your own if you have a wheelchair or if you have a pram. Since Finland is full of bicycles, there are special cars in every underground train, special places where you can bring your bicycle. This is what the lift looks like. Interestingly, there are no turnstiles at the entrance to the underground. So you just have to tap your ticket against the validator, but there is a warning that if you don't buy a ticket, there is an $85 fine, and there are people who monitor it on the underground here. I haven't seen them, but I'm sure they are there. This is what the busiest transport terminal of Scandinavia looks like. You can't even tell from the looks of it that there are hundreds of people waiting for their buses under the mall. In fact, the city plans to develop the entire central district of Helsinki underground in the near future along the same lines of this project. The city administration is hoping to move most of the transportation system, warehouses and car parks underground, as this will help reduce the load of the roads and the streets and will also help preserve the character of the city center so that the transportation infrastructure doesn't interfere with the enjoyment of the city. But even today it's possible to drive throughout Helsinki's underground with car parks and tunnels. For example, there is a tunnel that connects the Ruolakti and Kluvi districts. The shopping malls take deliveries and take their rubbish out using this tunnel. So here's the question of priorities, take a look. Tramway is a priority number one. The tram's coming, so the road got to be cleaned up. There's a terrific tram coming along the super clean tram tracks. Beautiful. The pavement's also being cleaned too, so it's comfortable for people to walk. It's been sprinkled with these fresh granite chips, it is clean, it's not slippery, and people don't have to worry that they'll slip. But what about parking? Nobody cares about it. Parking is not priority. It costs $4.2 an hour to park in center. Of course, you can't say that the streets in Helsinki are perfectly clean, because some of the small roads aren't the city's, but the council's responsibility. And so, they aren't all shining clean. There's quite a lot of ice and the cars are struggling to drive through here. 
I like to use Helsinki as an example of a city with safe traffic. In 2019, only three people were victims of traffic accidents here. One motorist and two motorcyclists. At the same time, there are still quite a few accidents. A total of 400 people were injured in traffic accidents in 2019, including 80 pedestrians. I don't want to speculate what the statistics would be if the city administrations and private companies didn't keep an eye on the city roads in winter. The snow and icy roads are monitored by a network of web cameras that transmit real-time images on the condition of the roads across Finland. Finnish motoring authorities monitor the cameras, compare them with the weather forecast and quickly call in a cleaning crew to clean a particular section of the road. For motorist convenience, some road sections are equipped with an electronic speed limit sign that change the maximum speed depending on the weather. In addition, every motorist in Finland is required by law to drive only with winter tires from 1st November to 31st March, otherwise they can receive a big fine. Study tires may only be used during the prescribed winter period as they damage the road surface, which most Finnish motorists criticize. In 2021, the country's largest newspaper, Helsingin Sanomat, published an in-depth piece on the state of the roads across the country and found out that over 13% of motorways were in an unusable condition. So, as you can see, guys, the Finns complain about the state of their roads, too. I decided to talk to blogger Ivan Prokopchik about traffic and winter in Finland. He moved to Finland from Karelia, a region on the Finnish-Russian border. Why would you need a car in Finland? In fact, you can manage without a car in small provincial towns. You need a car for traveling back to Russia and to go to another Finnish city like Helsinki. Is it possible to survive without a car in winter? Yeah, of course you can. I think you can do that in Helsinki too, because in my opinion there is a good public transport system in Helsinki. But then my question is how are you going to take your kids to school without a car? You know, we have kindergarten nearby, and a lot of mothers, they ride bicycles in winter. Yes, in winter. In Finland they sell such prams, I don't know if they have them in Russia, but they probably do. You put your kid in it, close it on all the sides so it doesn't get blown away by the wind, and strap it to the back wheel. And that's it. Off you go. Guys, look, it's the no feeding birds sign. I've said many times that you shouldn't feed the birds and every time I face a backlash from some strange people who start telling me that you should feed the birds, that pigeons have been sent to us by God, angels and somebody's flying souls. Friends, I don't want to upset you but pigeons are flying rats. If you feed pigeons, you just breed more of them. Because pigeons exist in such a way that they breed in exactly the right amount of food. If you want your whole city to be full of dirt, for it to be unsanitary, smelly and filthy, you can feed them. You can pour tons of bird food on the streets and then live in these conditions. But it's better not to feed pigeons. The pavilion is closed and is not used, so everything around is covered with ice. I must be careful not to fall in water. That would be unpleasant. Why did I come here? Why did I come here? You can fall here. It's something beautiful. Let's see some pictures of what it's supposed to look like. <laughs> I see public toilets. In Russia, if you see public toilets, 99% of the time they will be closed. They only work if there's a person, an old granny there, who sits and collects money. It's very rare, well, maybe in Moscow there are still a couple of public toilets that work. Let's see how it works here. I haven't gone in yet. I'll show them to you now. So let's go test the public toilets in winter in Helsinki. This is what a block of toilets look like. You have to press here to open. Oh, wow! This is what it looks like. Look, a clean, perfectly clean toilet. There's a toilet paper, there's showers, faucets, everything you need. And it doesn't smell. There's even a special bean for syringes. That's awesome! There's even one big toilet for people with special need.
Let's have a look at it. The door here opens automatically. Wow, wow. It's like a little toilet palace. But because it's a big toilet, people must have come here to do something naughty. Someone's been burning something, maybe some matches, I don't know. A little bit of vandalism. But still, it's pretty clean, it doesn't smell. I can't say that it's a mess. You can press this button to call a cleaner. Aha! Uh -huh. Look, I pressed close and there's water under the floor. That's how it cleans itself. It's a miracle of technology. It's clean, it doesn't smell. It must be a bit dirty because someone came in here to roll some cigarettes or burn something in here. I don't get what it is. There's no smell, it's not disgusting, there's metal everywhere, everything's clean and you can use it comfortably. Well, someone will say that it's just a toilet, but in fact it is one of the most important things because it is a need that every person has. And people who, for example, have the opportunity, they can go to a restaurant or something, but when you are a tourist in the city or just walking with your child and you want to go to the toilet or you need to change baby's nappies or baby wants to go to the toilet, there is a problem. And the kind of public toilets that there is in the city affects how comfortable people feel. That's a problem in Russia. You're always in pain and humiliation. It's insulting the way some of our public toilets look. They either don't have them or you have to go to some cafe or restaurant or order something. It's uncomfortable, to say at least. Bad weather didn't stop me from meeting with local urbanist Timo Hamailanen. He's been working with Helsinki City Administration on urban projects for a few years. What are these? <laughs> yeah, they, how they do, they, they clean the snow and then they push it in the big piles. And then the next cycle they come with trucks and... Uh, when? Yeah, next, next year or... Yeah, the, well, I don't they know. Wait, the, the, they wait for know. summer. Yeah, <laughs> maybe, I don't know. It's, it's a very random schedule. It's, it's and then they, what they do with the snow, then they put their... A few of these mm -hmm. big mountains somewhere. Mm -hmm. They make these giant mountains of snow. Whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, look, a person cannot walk over it. Ah, you see? Yeah. Ah, <laughs> There's a hero struggling for the snow. <laughs> okay, okay, that's it, he's done. <laughs> yeah, well, how is public transport uh, handling uh, this winter? And uh, if it was uh, up to you, what would uh, be first thing uh, to change in Helsinki transport system? Uh, well, here in Helsinki, there's a like when they clear and clean the roads after after snow. There's a priority system mm -hmm. where they start with the main public transport corridors. So if it snows, then it's quite quickly uh, cleaned for them, so trams and buses can go very safely. So it usually doesn't affect public transport very much. So it's mm -hmm. quite okay in that sense. So I haven't had any trouble, but I know. Some instances, you know, maybe during weekends the snow clearing is not that efficient. And I know, I just saw a friend of mine who was on a on a tram, a tram, and she posted on Instagram how they were the passengers cut out of the tram to to clean the the snow in front of the tram for a little bit. So because for some reason there was a big pile of snow that the tram couldn't go. So <laughs> also residents have to <laughs> help out a little bit in the matter. In your blog, uh, you mentioned uh, that winter in Finland uh, has changed with the global warming. Uh, how has climate change affects Helsinki and its people? Well, it's gotten warmer quite a lot. Uh, well, this winter right now it's very snowy and uh, there's a lot of ice, but there's been many winters where there's practically no snow at all. Uh, how it affects me personally or how I see it is that uh, I like to play ice hockey outside. But now here in Helsinki you can't really, it's rare that you have natural ice or it's, very, it's a very short period and you only have to have artificial uh, ice. And then of course for children 
children want to uh, use the snow for uh, you know, sledding down hills. You can't really go skiing in the city that well. What can you do in Helsinki in winter? <laughs> yeah, uh, first I'll tell you about the pool. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, normally it would be open uh, every day of the year. But, go, but, <laughs> but there was an accident. That, well, you know, from Christmas time, mm -hmm. if you have a Christmas market, that's always a, a big attraction, at least here in, in a lot of cities. So I think that's one key that I think in winter you should do this kind of event-based uh, programming maybe for public spaces. So in, during Christmas time you'll have a Christmas market maybe and then afterwards you might have another type of uh, public space activity. You could have um, Normally, we will also have a, like an ice skating rink in the city center next to the railway station, mm -hmm. where people can just uh, ice skate and then other people can kind of watch. So this is one activity. You can bring these kind of winter sports in some sort of way. Mm -hmm. Well, depending on what climate change allows mm -hmm. you to do, you could do that. Then, uh, then here we also, in Helsinki, there's this Lux Helsinki Light uh, Festival. It's always in the darkest period of the year where there's uh, light art installations and the, uh, there's a route that you can follow and see them. After my conversation with Timo, I've decided to have a look how do the residential areas look like in Helsinki. Here are our favorite prefabricated flat blocks. I think this building is from the 80s. And what interesting here is that even here, even the 80s architecture is still in its original form. This is what the entrance looks like. The original glass door, the original handles. No one has changed them. These are the authentic two beautiful handles. It just looks amazing. By the way, there are these brushes in front of the entrance. You needed to sweep out the stones and granite chips from the treads of your boots. Another thing that caught my eye is that in each entrance there is a shovel to clean snow out from the entrance. There is a broom to sweep the granite crumb out of the house and a dustpan. A bench? It all looks great. Well, here in Finland, of course, the cleanliness and the buildings is striking. Clean entrances, authentic entrances everywhere. Nobody broke anything, didn't vandalize it, didn't put metal doors and didn't turn into an ugly box with some housing and utilities art. Everything is clean and beautiful in spite of the fact that these buildings is about 30, 40 years old. But it looks like it has just been built. It is from some kind of advertisement leaflet. You could even use it as a set for a movie about those times without changing anything. It's very cool. This is how Finns respect their architecture, their cities. Not just buildings that they are monuments or historical sites, but relatively new buildings that aren't even considered architecture in Russia. By the way, here is a map of the residential complex. There are towers that are standing right here, nothing exciting from an urban planning point of view, of course, but it is just interesting in what order and how close to each other these buildings are located. No one has put the air conditioning, no one replaced the doors. Here is a different house, but we see the same breast door handles again. A man is riding a bicycle, but also with studded tires. By the way, when I was cycling around Moscow, I used studded tires. I've given up that idea now, not in terms of tires, but in terms of using bicycle in winter, because it's very dirty. People in Helsinki tend to live closer to the city center, not outside of the city. It is clear that there isn't enough space, so the authority decided to use the former port areas for development plots. They only left one port in center, and the other ones, including the industrial zones, are being actively renovated. And I've actually come to one of these very new areas in Helsinki. It's called Kalasatama. And now we're going to see how the Finns are building new housing.
I've been to this area before and filmed it, but as you can see, construction is still going on here. There are cranes, and new houses are still being built. So every time I come here, there is something new to show. Let us not praise Finns for cleaning up too much. Because, for example, here is a lot of ice in the residential area. Of course, there are some granite chips, but you can see the places where the ice is bare and you can slip and fall. It's very strange that a car is here because it's prohibited to drive here. And if we look this way, we'll see an interesting case, because here we have bicycles parking and someone has left their bikes for winter. But if you look closely, we will see that they aren't locked. So it's just back wheel that's locked and they are not changed to the front. It's obvious that there are many cases of stealing. Nobody wants these bikes. But someone else ditched their motorcycle. It's a shame because it looks great, but as far as I'm aware, it's not very good for a bike to be abandoned like this for the winter without shelter. Right, come on, let's go into courtyard. The steps are more or less cleaned up here, these are granite chips, there is no parking in the courtyard, obviously. There's an area for residents, you can let the children go and play, as you can see that there are quite a lot of children's toys, so children play here, leave their toys and no one take them away. By the way, you have to be careful with Finnish courtyards, because I have already a negative experience with police. I was in Helsinki a few years ago and wanted to show how everything is organized here. But the vigilant residents called the police, who came and checked my papers, asked what was I doing there, because they thought I was a bike thief. They thought I was taking photos of bicycles to steal them later. There's already a lot of ice and not many chips, so walking straight like that isn't easy. There are several types of winter shoes here. There are studded soles, there are these special overlays that flip over and become studded. There are also simple overlays that you can put on over ordinary boots that also come with studs to make it more comfortable to walk on ice. It, for example, I walked in the center of Helsinki and was absolutely sure that I wouldn't slip, I wouldn't be so sure about it here. The architecture is very, very simple, there are no masterpieces. It's nice that the buildings as a whole aren't too tall. In the new areas, the waste sorting system is quite interesting. They have an underground rubbish disposal unit here. It's a rubbish disposal unit for the whole neighborhood. It's pneumatic and it works like a pneumatic mailbox. You put your bag in there, it goes underground to the sorting station, which is located in the end of the street. But in addition to the underground trash chute, there are local trash bins that you can use for recycling. What kind of rubbish can you put in here? Large cardboard, for example, large boxes that you can have fit into the rubbish sorting unit. You have to put in glass and metal into separate bins. So if you have rubbish like this, you place it in the ground vaults, where special machines come and pick it up. And if you have general rubbish, food waste, bags, paper, newspapers and everything else, you put it into pneumatic waste units. It is a combined system that makes it possible to sort everything and handle waste responsibly. By the way, what is interesting is that you can't just open these compartments, because you need a special card that only residents have, because you have to pay for this service. Okay, you ask Ilya, why don't you show anything bad? Is there nothing bad in Finland? This is a pedestrian crossing that goes into a snowdrift. That's it. If it makes anyone feel better now, congratulations.
When we talk about building new neighborhoods, energy efficiency cannot be overlooked. In Russia, no one really thinks about it because our utilities are relatively affordable. Well, yes, some Russians may disagree with me, saying that the costs are high and they barely make ends meet. But compared with what they pay in Europe, utilities like electricity, water and everything else is subsided. So people aren't interested in investing in the energy efficiency of their homes to do any renovation because any renovation will be too expensive and will never pay off. In Finland, prices for everything are much higher, so houses are built energy efficient. Here in Finland, as many other European countries, the utility prices are extremely high. The resources are very expensive, electricity, water, heating, all of it costly. So, at the construction stage, it is easier to spend more money to get an energy efficient house but then save on utility bills. But it is gone further and some houses are built in such a way that they are fully self-sufficient in energy. How do you do that? Through the wind turbines, solar panels and so on. And then there are modern technologies that make the most efficient use of all your building's energy. Well, we can explore ventilation as a simple example. How does a standard ventilation system work? The used air simply flows outdoors and the clean air from the street enters the building. And if we talk about winter, it heats up, so a lot of energy is wasted. How does this happen in Finland? The warm exhaust air from the building is not immediately discharged outside, but it is used to heat the cold air that comes from outdoors. Consequently, less energy is needed for heating the room. This is just one example. There are a lot of modern materials and technologies, we will not dwell on it, because the topic of this video is a bit different. What is interesting is that there are buildings in Finland where people do not pay utility bills because the building itself gives out energy. What's more, there are some buildings that produce more energy than the occupants need. And they can even sell it and earn some cash. It doesn't just work with electricity. For example, the same thing applies to water, where rainwater is collected and later used for irrigation or as service water for the house. The same applies to old buildings from 60s, 70s, with typical panel block, of which there are a lot of here in Finland. Almost all of them have already been reconstructed, because it is more profitable for tenants to take a loan from bank and reconstruct their house, to insulate it, to make it more energy efficient, and then save on utility bills. There are similar programs in Baltic, in Estonia, Lithuania and Latvia, People are also renovating their houses. Tenants take out loans for bags to renovate their Soviet-era apartment buildings. And after five to ten years, it's getting paid off, thanks to lower utility bills. While walking around Kalasatama, I met a subscriber. She offered to show me how the communal areas inside the houses are arranged. Let's take a look inside the new housing. Oh wow, it is so clean here, it is so nice. That's not very clean to be honest. Every tenant or owner has a key to everything. Here, come in please. This is laundry. My clothes are currently in there. We have a dryer too. On the wall to your right there is a calendar from the first to the last day of the month and time. And we put our keys in. For example, my key opens like this, and I moved it and changed the time when I'm planning to do my laundry. This is where proms and bicycles and so on are kept. All sorts of things that are purely for children. There are certain rules that specifically in this room we can only store children's stuff, not adults. Thank you very much, goodbye. Good luck and all the best. I remember what my entryway in the center of Moscow looks like in winter and everything's leaking there, there's all of this dirt and sodium chloride from all the shoes, it's just terrible there. And here you walk in it, it's sterile. There's a very big difference. 
It turns out that it can't be clean in winter. Here's a small kindergarten, a simple two-story kindergarten with playgrounds. And there's a shopping center with a metro station. Under the ground here, there's a rubbish sorting unit with a pneumatic rubbish pipes. There are no icicles anywhere on any of these buildings. You can see the heating wires everywhere. And again, you'll see the all the downpipes, they go straight into drain. Water gargles through them, they are heated, the water goes into the drain and no icicles or extra ice on the pavement are formed. For example, here's a house that has a pipe that doesn't go all the way into the ground, but it is heated. The water flows through this pipe absolutely calmly and nothing is frozen, everything works. I talked to Finnish beautification officials about how the city administration works in winter. Do you use bicycles in winter? Well, personally me, yes. <laughs> Uh, and we try to get more, make it easier to bike year-round uh, to get more people used to bicycles because at the moment our bicycle traffic volumes drop to about 10% from what they are in in uh, like busier season in spring and summer and so on. What the reason why? What's the problem in uh, winter? Uh, yeah, it, the main main reason is that uh, the it's not comfortable and, and safe uh, in many places to bike in winter. So, uh, for example, here when you have this uh, clean asphalt, it's uh, almost like summer condition, but then, then outside of these uh, prioritized routes, uh, it's uh, more risky and feels more dangerous too. After Helsinki, I go to Oulu, uh, with an old world. Uh, much more people with bicycle there. Yeah. No. Yeah, yeah. I, in Helsinki, the, the transit system is uh, so, uh, uh, the coverage is so good and the level of service is so good so that people then uh, can switch uh, from uh, cycling to transit more easily in Helsinki than they do in, in Oulu. In Oulu. And in Oulu, they have, they have concentrated a lot on how to make cycling comfortable in winter. Today I worked for several hour, uh, hours. Uh, downtown see and I see no icicles. Well, of course, firstly, snow is often removed from the uh, from yeah. the roofs, mm -hmm. and also the like the ice forms when the house is let off heat from the inside, and the Finnish uh, buildings are generally really well insulated, so so uh, it doesn't get to freeze so much on the on the roof. Roofs and the drainage is uh, mostly done done so that the melting water gets to uh, gets away better. Mm -hmm. But in certain times it can be a problem, and then then we have to uh, close the close the certain sidewalks mm -hmm. so we can drop the ice. There's a, a tram uh, maintenance tram for the tram lanes. Have you been in St. Petersburg? Yep, and me not. Like you not? Go. Okay, well, what about you? How do you like it? Oh, uh, well, the Nevsky perspective was quite uh, color oriented, let's say, and the whole environment was quite white, but, but of course it has beautiful art history, like it has beautiful architecture, everything. But, but yes, the, the, the one thing that I do remember was that there were cars all around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is now uh, investing about uh, 25 uh, million euros uh, a year for uh, cycling infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So it uh, uh, over the last decade, Helsinki has uh, gotten a lot of uh, new best practice uh, cycling infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So we are we are doing this uh, unidirectional separated uh, solutions for cycling, like in Copenhagen right mm -hmm. now.
This is a railway station. It's gorgeous, amazing station. And near the station, look, they haven't removed the snow yet. There are some pretty big snow piles. And now, friends, let's take a look at how Helsinki Central Station is set up. This is the lobby, where the kiosks are located, and they all have pretty much the same decorations. They sell sandwiches, magazines, newspapers. It's the typical European food for when you are on the go. There's lots of advertising, and I can't say that there's a strict adherence to the design code. It could have been done in a way more formal way. And there's a door, and they exit to the platforms. The station is relatively old, but there's nothing so super interesting that you have to say, wow, look at that. It's nice, little Scandinavian train station. It's the architecture of it that's interesting. The architecture of the station is simply gorgeous. The building historical and not in a bad condition. Not all the entrances are open 24 hours a day. And this one, for example, opens from 5 a.m. to 2 a.m. And the central hall of Helsinki train station looks very cool. And of course you can't ignore the fact that there's no security check, no guards. I spent my time at the station absolutely unnoticed and no one comes near me and doesn't make any trouble. Using the station is easy and pleasant, unlike what they have arranged in Russia, with the theater of security, with the endless screens, with locked entrances, creating a lot of problems for passengers. Here you can go straight to the underground station. But we don't need to go to the metro. Just look at these amazing doors. They are beautiful wooden doors. Everything is capped in its original form. Very cool. The Helsinki Central Station was built in 1918. And this particular building is an architectural monument. Not a bad example of Art Nouveau. There's a tram right here, you can get off the station, and there's a tram stop. But now, friends, let's see what the Finnish post looks like. I know what Russian post looks like very well, let's see what the Finns have done. Here is the central post office. It's very stylish. There is a self-service table where you can arrange a parcel and there are mailboxes here. This is a cash desk, this is where you get your line ticket and there is a big shop. Contrary to Russian post shops, they sell the things you need, like boxes, postcards, envelopes, everything you need for packing. Also, there are boxes post boxes for those who rent them here. And then there are the stamps. These are the current stamps in use now. There are different churches on them. There are all kinds of envelopes for sale, wrapping paper, boxes, whatever you need for mailing. One thing I don't understand is why we don't have that. How come Russian post office turned into some kind of mall stall underground? I don't know anything but the post office. They sell canned goods, biscuits, pads. But if you try to buy stamps there, try to buy a normal postcard or something, it won't be that easy. In short, it's a complete disaster. It's incomprehensible what they turned Russian post office into. The most disgusting weather we have is this snow-rain storm that is impossible to hide from. And then there's the wind. If any of you have visited St. Petersburg, you will understand what I mean. 
In here is how the pavements look like in this weather. Puddles, ice. But nevertheless, it's possible to pass. There are no insurmountable obstacles. The granite chips help from slipping. I was soon joined on my journey through Finland by my urbanist Andrei Yilbaev. Guys, I'll show you what a typical Finnish entrance hall and courtyard look like. You have to understand that in Finland, almost all houses, no matter if they're old or new, look pretty much the same and number of principles are followed. All the doors are exactly the same. You cannot change a door. They said that these doors are quite old, and it's old wooden door, and no one has put a metal one instead. Then on each door there is the name of the tenant who lives there and a flat number. The doorbell is down here somewhere. It's usually a mechanical bell. It's an old retro escalator with chairs. Let's have a look. What's interesting is the bench. The bench is ergonomically shaped like this. There are even some holes drilled in it, apparently so your bottom doesn't sweat while you're sitting down. It's super convenient. It's got the flat numbers who lives where and what floor they're on, so you know right away where you're going. Another cool thing is that they are glass doors. What's so good about it? Transparent doors in an escalator are safety measures, because many people are worried about some kind of chaos in the stairwells, and someone will sleep there or use there some sort of substances. And people who are constantly going up and down the elevator become observers, witnesses of everything that happens. And so having a we somewhere on the stairwell is no longer cool. And in other words, you have witnesses, observers who go up and down all the time and watch what is going on. Yeah, it's called passive social control. That is, you go up and control the second, third floor even though you live in fifth. It is quite convenient and I wonder why they don't do it in Russia. Making a small glass window in the standard metal sheet is easy. The elevator is also very interesting because it is turned away from the stairs and you see a wall, but nothing else. That is a special way the staircase is constructed. They still have the no lift call buttons everywhere, on all of the floors. And the manual is old too. And yes, that's right, the next thing that is very interesting is in the entryway. It's just perfectly clean, although there are no concierges, no permanent cleaner, but nevertheless, it's perfectly clean even at the entrance. It is as if we were at someone's home. The secret of the perfect cleanliness. The entrance, the original door, everything is very beautiful. And even here it is nice and clean, because Finns don't use toxic chemicals, sand and all of the sorts of rubbish on the roads. Beautiful. And this is so that when you open the door, you put it on this pin to keep it open. And by the way, concerning keys in Finland and in other Scandinavian countries, I'm at this universal key. This key can be used for the gate of the entrance door and from your front door to the flat. It is quite a complex shape, but it's universal key for all the doors, so you don't have to carry many different ones in your pocket, it's super convenient. The bicycle parking spot is full, of course. When you look at these bicycle parking spots, it's always said how people leave their bikes and roof for winter. Poor little bicycles. This yard is divided with fences inside because they are different houses, different plots of land, and therefore each one has its own story. The one is next to it, for example, has a garden house and some swings. All of them have the minimum done and all live perfectly well. The territory is divided due to the fact that they pay for each square meter here. So, of course, 
you have a fence and everything. In Russia, people really like to put some kind of fence and a barrier and so on, but they don't like to pay for the land. So they want the city to clean up their yard and got everything done, but at the same time, they would not let the strangers in. Watch out for possible snow drifts. But you see, not icicles, just snow. Oh, we are witnessing how they clean the streets from snow, come on, wow! This little tractor is shoveling snow with all the crumbs. Look how cute it is! You can see it's made up of snow and granite crumbs, but it's very clean. You can safely take it in your hand. Here we have this car going. It's got a container of granite grit on the back and it's shoveling the melted snow. Do you see how many sweepers they are? Let's go have a look. Here's another tractor. They're breaking up ice. As if it is snow cat drove along the ski track, left these small cuts and thus breaks the ice and you can safely walk on such pavement. Note that there are cuts triangular, but then you go to Oulu, they'll be circular there, we'll be able to compare them. They've opened a tech shop here, but all these old counters that used to be here are still part of the interior design. The only thing is that they are not using them in any way. They just stand there without serving any functional purpose. Yeah, but here's the tiles and everything. It's the old post office building, but the interior has been preserved and new tenants were not allowed to spoil it. There are mailboxes at the end, which have all been kept in the original design. I have already explained that doors, windows, signs, signposts are all part of the architecture of the city, the architecture of the building. It's very important because when you normally walk along the street, we don't look at the architecture of the building. We only see the first couple of meters up the wall, so where we're only in contact with those two meters on the facade. By the way, there's an interesting experiment. Look up and you'll be shocked, because you probably didn't even know the, what the buildings along your favorite route looks like. And we come into contact with the facade, and that includes the doors. Look at this beauty. There are some old handrails here. Very interesting. It's all in its original state, and there's nice details that make the city more appealing. Here, for example, there's a 28 sign it is so beautiful, so old, so original. Here's the gate. It's also an old one that was hidden here by a unique design. Again, here's another unique neighboring door. Actually, it's all these details that we encounter that make the city pleasant to walk around. It's interesting to walk here even among the residential blocks. You can say, Ilya, you only show us the snow-covered streets in overcast skies. But what about those who don't like to go out in winter and sit in an expensive cafes? I'll tell you, go to Helsinki Library. Speaking of winter activities, there is where people spend their time. They spend their time in the library. There are so many people here. That said, people aren't just doing nothing here, but they are all working on something. There are 3D printers over here, you can print something. And there are printers and some metal cutters and machines, just about anything you want. A person just went into read into that room, because it's a quiet space with no food policy, so people can actually read there. It's the third floor where the most beautiful space is, because we're right under the roof. Well, it's probably even better during the day, of course, but even in the evening they have these skylights and extra illumination, so during the day works as a skylight. But at night it turns into a lantern. Just so you understand, Andre and I just walked in 
and they didn't check our bags, our documents, there's no guard, there's no janitor. We just walked in here, walked up, and we can sit, read, relax, and no one will say a word to us. There's PS5, PS4, Xbox, Nintendo, and you can pick it up and like a video cassette from a special store a few decades ago, but here you can pick a game or a DVD. And there's this DNA-shaped staircase that we climbed that leads up here. There's a pram parking area with a panoramic view. This is probably the most beautiful pram parking area. The space here is so cozy that it makes you to want to spend time here. There are girls sitting in a corner, having a picnic like they are in the park. They have food there, some crisps, water, someone there is watching them through the webcam, and they are just chatting. There's a railing for adults and a railing for children. The ones for children are smaller. But speaking of ergonomics, unfortunately, modern architects think about making their designs look good in photos, but they don't think about making it comfortable for people to hold on to. In this respect, the old St. Petersburg entryways certainly teach us how it should be done properly. This is absolutely uncomfortable. Oops, that's what all these libraries lead to. LGBTQIA+. That's it, friends. A whole section of books for which, in Russia, I don't know they'd properly burn the library down. It's a good thing we don't have that. In fact, this is a very cool example of what happens when a city invests in human capital, when on valuable land, right in the city center, where the central station is, and there is a temptation to build an office building or a shopping center, they'd make tons of cash, but they decided to build a public library instead. They didn't just build it some ugly shed that often happens today when they try to create a public space, but here they invited the architect, designed an incredible building, made it comfortable for everybody. And when I come here in any time, it is always full of people. People come here with their children to study and do homework, and there are a lot of workshops. Everything you need to feel like a civilized person. And the interesting thing is that there are kids and homeless people here that some people don't really want to see them, maybe. But it's just like a public space. The people you see on the city square are the same ones you see here. There are no barriers. Wherever you may be, you may come in. Nobody checked our documents. Nobody asked what we are doing here. We are not Finnish citizens. We have almost all the services available to us here. Nobody has turned us away. In general, everything is very friendly. And I don't know if you noticed, but there is not a single security guard. That what trusting people means. Somehow this whole community self-regulates. I mean, there is only one granny sitting up. There is an information center. There is no warden on every floor. No guards. Yeah, there is not a single guard. There's not even a guard at the entrance. Well, it's like a public space. It's totally free. There's another information center here. A granny, but she's not here to harass anyone. She's here to answer your question. Maybe we can ask her if we as foreigners can play dandy, for example. We just, we just want to know how it works. Right, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, we need to be registered on that website to be able to book. Yeah, yes, you need to have a, um, have a Google account okay. or a Facebook account mm -hmm. right. or a ULE, which is a Finnish broadcasting company, then you can book it. Andre notice that the lady at the library reception speaks English and explained 
everything very well. It's nice and it's unbelievable. So we found out how things work in order to book stuff. You have to register on the website, you can book meeting rooms, studios and game rooms, but you can't take books out. You can't borrow books or book some studios because you need a library card. To get a card at the library you need a Finnish address. If you study here, for example, it's easy to get around. How's this for toilet? Look, there is a bottle filling station. It looks like a faucet show, but actually it's not. There is a special bottle filler tap. There's a sink for adults. And this is for children. Someone might see some gender stereotypes here in the form of the color scheme, but no, it's just a design. In order not to offend anyone, in terms of inclusivity, there's just a huge number of stalls. You can choose any that you like. Last year in Russia there was a life hack that you wanted your snow drift to be cleared away, you had to write Navalny on it with paint. Then the council workers would immediately come running and plow over the snow drift or more likely just clean it up. It's the same in Helsinki, only looks like they wrote Verlamov. It's the same here. There's a giant snow drift right in front of the library and there is something written on it. For snow clearing there's no point in keeping a large number of special machines to deal with worse snowfalls. So, as a rule, they just work out some temporary measures for the time of these snowfalls using first the parking spaces and the secondly the public spaces for storage of the snow until a certain time when the priority streets will be dealt with it seems to me that they will do that all over the world they also have the occasional snowfall where they don't clean anything at all that's interesting if the weather forecast says that tomorrow the snow will melt anyway they just wait for it and don't waste resources Tomorrow it will melt on its own anyway. Yes, and in fact, some of the politicians are adopting this practice, but they are taking it a little way too far. And Finns are ready to wait for a half a day maximum. For example, if it's the snow at night, but the snow is expecting to melt in the morning, they probably won't touch it at night. But our officials wait until spring sometimes. For example, in Novosibirsk. Listen, I can't remember in what city I've seen such huge snow drifts. That's how it is, friends. Bicycle lane in the center of Helsinki. Yes, 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 use bicycles. They're always an alternative to a car. If only it was true. After Helsinki, we went to Oulu, a city in northern Finland. The distance between it and the capital is just over 600 kilometers. Well, friends, we are in Oulu, more precisely we are in Russia's Arhangelsk, because Oulu is a Finnish town which lies at the same latitude as Arhangelsk, and the climate is here very similar, same snowy and cold winter. The average temperature in winter and in summer differs by plus or minus 1-2 degrees. Precipitation is very similar, they have similar nature, similar climate, generally similar in everything, and even in terms of population they are close, because Arhangelsk population is 350,000 Oulu. 200,000, around 200,000, so it's not a village or something, we'll see if it's possible to live in such winter. We are standing in the very center and the first thing that shocks me is the number of people using bicycles. And the second thing is how clean it is, they have perfectly white pavements, we were driving from the airport and there were perfectly white crubs everywhere. Well, they're not absolutely perfect, but they aren't dirty. Look at the bike park, it's not even the city center. There are old bikes, even those with a child seat, that have regular summer tires. There are all relatively new bikes and you can see they are not even chained up. It's unbelievable. You wouldn't see something like that in Arhangelsk, even in... 10 years, even if some dramatic reforms will start right now. Bicycle is one of the main modes of transport here. Oulu's official website shows that over 20% of all trips in the city happen by bicycle. 
while the national average is barely 11 percent. Oulu has developed a good infrastructure for cycling. There are over 860 kilometers of paths and lanes and 200 cycle tunnels. The pioneer of cycling in Oulu is Mauri Mulila, is the local government's official who has been urging cycling and pedestrian extent since 1960s. In the early 70s, a new city plan was drawn up, which included a cycle path network in outline areas. In the last century, Oulu became Finland's center of innovation. In the 1980s, it became home to Nokia Development Center, the city main enterprise. In early 2000s, almost 40% of all mobile phones sold worldwide were Nokia. Thanks to the company's success, there were no problems with work and money in Oulu. According to Venture Beat publisher, back then Nokia had more than 4,800 employees and subcontractors working here. But Nokia soon began to lag behind the technological innovation and was losing global influence. In 2007, Apple introduced the iPhone, and then Google created the Android operating system. The Finnish company could not keep up with the new technology. Sales were falling, and a major crisis and downsizing began. In 2013, Nokia's mobile business was bought by Microsoft, which soon announced new layoffs. All the specialists were left out of work. After the collapse of the city's main enterprise, businessmen, the regional government of Oulu and former Nokia employees created a new development model, which the city still follows. First, the authorities introduced support for the healthcare startups. This program is run together with local research centers at the hospital. So far, 600 companies have participated in it. Next, the city of Oulu started attracting local and foreign capital to the city. About 10 new companies start operating here every year.